Shalom and greetings to everyone around the world. We'd like to welcome you to today's discussion. And as always, of course, from Israel, a very warm welcome to you, Baruch. How are you? Shalom, Christian. Doing well and yourself? Uh, we give thanks to the Lord in all circumstances, so we're doing well. So, uh, brothers and sisters, thank you for today's discussion. Um, we're prompted a lot of the times to do these discussions by questions that were asked online or through email. And uh, this is a very important one for a couple of reasons. Is Jesus, Yeshua, God? Now, uh, when I mentioned that we've had people writing to us because they would like that clarification, of course, but also they're also confronted by people that they know or that they don't know that well that are uh, from false religions or cults, uh, including Islam. And they normally ask the same question, you know, Yeshua, Jesus never called himself God or there's no reference to that in the New Testament. So it's about hopefully us uh, looking at it from a biblical perspective on how we can equip brothers and sisters on how to respond. So if you're ready, Brooke, let's begin. Let's begin. Okay, so as always, we will, of course, begin with Scripture, with the Word of God, that is the most important thing. Colossians 2, verses 8 to 9. Beware, I like how he warns us clearly, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Over to you, Baruch, for your comments. Yeah, the, the short answer is yes, the Bible does definitely teach that Yeshua is divine, that he's the son of God, that he is God. This is an excellent scripture that I think makes it very clear uh, there's others as well that, that not only points to, but affirms very boldly and clearly that Yeshua is God. So if you ask anyone connected with our organization, we believe our statement of faith clearly speaks to the divinity of Messiah. Amen. Thank you. Titus 2, verse 13, looking for the blessed hope, which is the harpazo or the rapture, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Your comments, bro. Yeah, this is an, an excellent scripture because if we use grammar, which we should, we see here that the word appearing, Greek is a very, very precise language. If we're speaking about two individuals, we could use the term appearing and put that in the plural to show that. But in the Greek, it's in the singular. So there it speaks of God and our Savior, not as, as two uh, entities, two persons, but one. So the grammar helps us understand and clarify and be confident in our theology that once again, that our Savior, Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus Christ is indeed God. Amen. Thank you. Second Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Now, the reason why I also put Peter uh, scriptures is because, sadly, some people say, well, Paul rewrote his own gospel. I mean, where they get that from is ridiculous. But that's why we're expanding and not just look at Paul's writings. But Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, same type of language, same conclusion. The scripture makes it very clear in numerous different ways and in abundancy of passages that, that our Savior, Messiah Yeshua, is our God. Amen. Thank you. John 8, 58. Now we're making reference to the Messiah, Yeshua himself, his own words. Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now, before I hand over to you, Baruch, I've made a little comment there, a reference to Isaiah 43.10 for the same I am reference. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, Baruch, but apparently, ago ami in the Greek that Yeshua used here is exactly identical to I am as God described in Isaiah 43 10. 
I, I believe you're absolutely right on that. I haven't uh, checked it to, to confirm, but we see clearly that in the Greek language, what you said, this ego eimi is a way of conveying the, the view of I am. Now, it's interesting if we go back and I realize your reference is Isaiah 4310, but we know in the book of Exodus, yes. we see that, that Moses asked God, who shall I say that sent me? And in all the English Bibles, it says, tell them I am. But literally in that passage, it says, I will be. And it, it speaks about God declaring himself and demonstrating who he is by showing what he will do. So that passage is a little bit different. But when we get to Isaiah and others, it, it clearly, when in the New Testament, it says that phrase that you mentioned, ego and me, it's clearly an attempt, a spirit-filled, a spirit-anointed attempt to capture the Hebrew for this same concept that refers to God as the great I am. Amen. Thank you. Let's look at another one, once again, from Messiah himself directly in John 8, 24. Therefore, I say to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And I made the same reference to Isaiah 43, 10. But your comments on this scripture, Baruch? Yes, M Messiah, especially in John's gospel, there's many passages where Messiah reveals himself in a variety of different ways. I am the light of the world. I'm the bread of, 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 of life and such. And it's all to point out who he is and another characteristic. So this I am speaking about the divinity. But let me point out something. We need to be careful because there are those who also believe in the divinity of, of Yeshua. This is great. But they have a oneness doctrine that, that God, and they, they teach something that is heretical, and that is God, who is one, we believe that, but God simply appears in different expressions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he appears in the model of a father or a son or the Holy Spirit. Where we disagree with that oneness doctrine, we believe in the Trinity, that God has manifested himself in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three equaling one, one equaling three. It's hard for, for a human being to grasp that. We also see related in some of the rabbinical writings, this same concept of, of a Trinitarian of, of three having to do with the one God. So we see also the sages of Israel also pointed out this, this three aspect in regard to one God. And one of the places we see that is in the book of Isaiah, which this passage is taken and, and part of the liturgical prayer service, where we say, Kadosh, 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 Hashem Vavot, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord of hosts. Why three times this, this triune aspect of God? And can I ask this, Baruch, um, because I know it's, it's something that people do uh, are curious about, but when Messiah in these type of scriptures, especially quoting from Isaiah, and he called, he made reference to himself as I am, the great I am, surely the Pharisees and the scholars in those days knew that, and that's why sometimes they wanted to stone him, correct? Exactly, <laughs> and, and he was accused ultimately in the Sanhedrin for blasphemy because they understood that he proclaimed himself as, as God. A uh, uh, very key passage is when Messiah, when he was asked by Caiaphas, the high priest, now, are you the son of the most high God, the, the blessed one? And Messiah says, yes, he affirmed that. That speaks of his divinity, the son of God. But he also quoted from the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter seven, where it speaks about the, the son of man, one like the son of God, if we look at it closely, that he goes and appears before the ancient of days, that is God the father. No debate about this within Christianity and Judaism. The ancient of days is, is God. Yes. And he inherits everything to the extent that he's also worshiped. So once he associated this passage with himself, 
This is when the high priest says, why do we have to hear any more testimony? He himself has confirmed blasphemy because he says that he's God. So the Sanhedrin understood that Messiah said concerning himself that he is divine. Amen. And I think before we move on to other scriptures, uh, and due to the context of time, we didn't include it in this discussion, but in reference to I am when uh, Jesus was arrested that night and betrayed by Judas, when they asked uh, with the soldiers, uh, and, you know, a very large group of soldiers, and they asked, you know, who is Jesus of Nazareth? And he says, I am. Isn't it amazing and powerful how they all fell backwards as well under the power of that name? Just what are your comments on that, bro? <laughs> yeah, another great passage where John clearly conveys to his audience, the reader of John's gospel, the divinity of Messiah with just what we're talking about right now, that term that in Greek is translated, I am. It's, it's a, a Greek way of capturing that same thing that you mentioned in Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, speaking of, of God as the great I am. So once again, a great illustration of that power of that name that he associated with himself. Amen. Thank you. Now, we're going to look closely at Revelation 22, um, verses 12 to 13. This is uh, Messiah speaking as well. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, the reason why I put their reference once again to Revelation 1.8 um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, Brooke, but in Revelation 1.8, when he talks about, I am the Alpha and the beginning, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is, who was, and is to come, the Almighty, that's God the Father in Revelation 1.8. But here in Revelation 22, verses 12 to 13, it's Messiah Yeshua quoting exactly the same name as God the Father. Is that correct? That is exactly correct. And one of the purposes of the book of Revelation, we know it's, and people have always asked me, I, I sometimes confusing, but John's the author. So it's John's book of Revelation. The book was written by him, but it's the revelation by John of Messiah Yeshua. And John wants to reveal, and he does this, especially in this first chapter, which you reference, he chooses Old Testament passages that relate to God the Father, and he takes them and he applies them to God the Son to announce and confirm just what we're talking about, that Yeshua is God. Amen. Such beauty in the scriptures. John 20, 28. Um, and, and I'll hand over to you, Brooke, uh, very quickly so you can give some context about Thomas and what had happened here. But, and Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. Once again, someone else making reference to Messiah as Lord and God. Over to you, Brooke. And Yeshua did not correct him and say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not the Lord God. He, he never said anything in, in conflict with what Thomas proclaimed. Obviously, the context that you referenced is that Thomas didn't even believe in the resurrection. Mm. He was doubting these things. And he said, I will not believe unless I can feel, to touch, to see all of these things. And Yeshua appeared, and when he met the resurrected Savior, the one that he knew had died, been buried, but now, having been raised from the dead, he proclaims just that statement concerning Yeshua, that he is Thomas's Lord, and Thomas is God, meaning a description, a declaration, we could say, affirming the, the lordship and the divinity of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you. Now, I'm going to use a couple of uh, different verses here from uh, John 1, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 14. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then verse, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full grace and truth. Your comments, bro. 
John, John is writing in a way he, he sets forth who is God and he speaks with God about God, commenting on the word, which we all know from the context is Yeshua. Yes. And when he says the word was God, there we have a clear reference again to the divinity. And when it speaks about beholding the glory of the only begotten of the Father, here again, this is theological language that points clearly to John proclaiming the divinity, the identity of Messiah as the Son of God. The sages, the members of the Sanhedrin, when, when they understood that he was saying, I'm the son of the, the blessed one, they understood that this pointed to his divinity. So for those individuals that say the Bible, the New Testament never says about the divinity of Messiah, that is simply false. Amen. And I think we've gone through quite a few scriptures to prove that. <clears throat> Just a couple of others. John 10, verse 30, I and my father are one. And John 14, verse 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? Obviously addressing Philip. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Your comments, Will. Yeah, just great scriptures. And, and we have gone through a, a, a good portion, but there's so many more yes. that speaks to the divinity of Messiah, his identity, and also in the Old Testament. For example, we all know the passage about uh, Messiah being born in Bethlehem uh, from the prophecy of uh, uh, Micah, chapter 5, verse 2 in English, verse 1 in Hebrew. If you look carefully at the Hebrew, it speaks about how the one who's going to be born, this ruler, this, this righteous judge, is of the Father. And his origins are from before the ancient days. So when you look at that in the original language, it really proclaims that same thing that we're emphasizing. The New Testament confirms, but many Old Testament passages as well, that speaks to the Messiah being God. Amen. Thank you. You certainly touched on earlier, Baruch, about the, the, the doctrine and the theology of the Trinity, which we all embrace, of course, being biblical. Um, I, I just put these diagrams both in English and Spanish. Um, uh, maybe you can talk to them a little bit, Baruch, because to explain that some people do get confused, but it is actually quite easy to understand in terms of the Trinity. Can I just have, hand over to you? Well, um, understanding from a confessional standpoint, from faith, that, that God is three persons, one God, we, we can understand that. Now, when we begin to explain it, I'll tell you the experience that uh, uh, in the seminary I went to, our systematic theology professor would invite pastors from the area to talk about the divinity, the Trinity. And he would let them speak. And all of these said, I believe in, in the divinity of Christ. I believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. And they would get up and begin speaking and they didn't go very far before they said something that was in conflict. And he would always, you know, chasten them. And it was done in a humorous way to show that it is difficult sometimes in the limitation of our language to try to give examples and explanations. The best, the best that we can see is these scriptural references that you shared to point to the fact of the divinity and really the doctrine of the Trinity what it emphasizes, as well as the virgin birth, is the divinity of Messiah. We, we have God being one, so these diagrams are very helpful in, in understanding that if you look at the outside where it says the Father is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, they are distinct, three persons, but there is one God. As the scripture and it uses a unique word, for and it's translated as Godhead. It speaks about something that is related to God, his nature, his character, his identity, and how we see in another scripture is how uh, Messiah did not think it was something to be grasped, something that, that he had to steal to take. 
to be to be seen as God. So there's so many more scriptures, both in the old and the new, that point to the Trinity. And before we get comments, and we will get comments, we've had them previously, Baruch, when someone will write to us and say, the word Trinity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. What are your comments and your response to that? Yeah, many times what we find is the Bible speaks to something, and then we, we take a word to, to define that, to help people understand the reference, what the scripture is referencing. So if people have a problem with the term Trinity, uh, may, they may have a problem with, the, with the, the word not being there, but the concept, what the Trinity speaks to, what it reveals is clearly referenced in a variety of scriptures. Again, the Trinity speaks to the fact that we have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is divine. The Spirit of God has the same attributes as God the Father, and we see Messiah does as well. One, one person uh, wrote me an email some time ago about the, the fact that God is not God omnipresent. He's everywhere, correct? And he says, I believe that about the Holy Spirit. Well, now he has two of the members of the Trinity, but he says, remember, Yeshua, he was limited by his body. Well, his body had limitations, but that did not limit him. And a great example of this is from the book of John at the end of John chapter one, when, when he saw Nathaniel sitting under a tree. And Nathaniel knew that, that in a natural way, Yeshua could not have seen him. He was not there. Correct. He could not have witnessed this. Yep. But, but Yeshua referenced that. He knew that because he's omniscient. He doesn't have to bodily be someplace to know everything that's going on. And that's why when Yeshua said that, he says the same thing, that you are the son of the living God, that you are the Messiah, and he received him. So, so many ways the scripture points to the divinity of Messiah and the divinity of Messiah and the Trinity basically supports that God is one, as the scripture says, but that, that there's the three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, part of that Godhead, each one being God, not parts of God, not the sum total of God. If you put them together, each one individually is God, but there's one God, these three persons, one God. Amen. And, and it's great that you summarized it like that, Baruch, for people that make such a big deal that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, because like you said, it's a, it's a theological term used to summarize the concept. But I would also, for those people that get so stuck on that word that it's not in the Bible, uh, I would also have that dialogue to say to them, if they know the word of God, say, well, you believe that God is omnipresent. They usually say, yes, you believe that God is omniscient. Yes. And then I would just question them. Well, you believe that, but neither of those two words are in the Bible. So in a way, uh, you're sort of like knowing how to respond with love, but making them think not to dwell so much on that word. But anyway, that's that's my feedback there. I, I really appreciate you sharing <laughs> that example because I never thought of that. And, and I'm going to use that in the future, what you just said about omniscient and omnipresence. That's excellent. That's Good. That's good. The last thing that people are curious when it comes to uh, Yeshua as God, so they will ask, so who do we pray to? Now, I made a comment there that I'll get you, to, of course, to expand on Baruch, but Yeshua was the best model for us, and we shouldn't try and change or improve on what he said. Um, so Yeshua taught us to pray, and we pray to the Father, like in Matthew 6, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer. We approach the Father in Yeshua's name, uh, because Yeshua said that no one comes to the Father through me. So would you agree with that, Baruch? But what are your comments on that? Yeah, when I pray, I pray to God the Father, the name yeah. of Messiah Yeshua. I don't believe there's a problem if we pray directly to Yeshua. Correct. Uh, um, so I, I'm very, very uh, uh, comfortable with praying to God the Father in the name of Yeshua. Um, one thing I'll say that's that's related and that is that if one rejects the, the virgin birth, he's rejecting the divinity of Messiah. Amen. If you reject the divinity of Messiah, then you, you don't have the identity. You don't know who Yeshua is. 
And if you don't recognize the proper identity, then you can't receive someone. You may use that name. He may be a Messiah figure for you, but you haven't believed in the same way that Islam. Uh, I was on a plane recently and was speaking to a very nice person. We, we didn't agree. We had a good conversation, but we certainly didn't agree. And I said to him, and he happened to be, be Muslim, I said, no, you don't believe in, in Yeshua, in Jesus. I said, because what the Quran shares about him is different than what the, the Bible says about him. So you use that name, but the identity, the attributes, the work, all of that is different. So you don't believe in the biblical Yeshua. And in that same way, if you deny the divinity, you don't believe in the biblical Yeshua. You cannot say that you've received him. And therefore, if you reject the divinity, you are not saved. Amen. And that would have been a great flight to be on, bro. I think the Lord purposely put that uh, person right next to you with the uh, Muslim faith. So any final comments, Baruch, uh, for the viewers? I think we've shared in the time limited <coughs> available to us quite a few scriptures there about uh, confirming, clearly demonstrated biblically that Yeshua, Jesus, is God. And hopefully we've prepared them as well to give some responses, to look at some scriptural references if they're ever confronted with that. But your final comments, Baruch. Yeah, great scripture. We believe in the divinity of Messiah. We believe in the Trinity. Uh, people may disagree with that. That's their prerogative, but that's where we are. And we feel very secure in that, that belief based upon the revelation of God's word. We touched on a few scriptures, many, but nevertheless few in comparison to all the places in the Bible that we could have turned to to support this doctrine. Amen. And I think that from my personal perspective, I keep reminding people that the day will come where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. It's not just some, every knee will bow and confess that he is Lord. So if you haven't done it yet, I encourage you to do it now willingly uh, because then it's just too late. But uh, I thank you Baruch for uh, your teachings. I certainly enjoyed them today. Uh, so I say to everyone watching, all the viewers in English and Spanish, thank you for, for tuning in. And if you like this video and if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, share and like this video. It certainly assist us. You can write to us as always at Australasia at loveisrael.org. And uh, Baruch, thank you once again. Uh, any final comments? Thank you, Christian. No, important, important subject. And we pray that people will examine the scriptures for themselves, the ones that, that you included, and discover the truth that they might know the power of God. Amen. So, brothers and sisters, thank you for joining us. Uh, shalom and God bless. Thank you.